Welcome to AFI's Fashion Week program, which is our masterclass this morning on Trends 2023 and sustainability. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Bronwyn Williams, uh, who will be taking us through a trend index report. And uh, just to give you more insights regarding Bronwyn, um, she has decades of experience in strategic management, trend research, and foresight. Consulting to clients in the public and private sector across the African continent. Her educational in credentials include tertiary qualifications in marketing, economics, foresight, and future studies from the University of Stellenbosch. She's currently a master's in applied economics from the University of Bath and a long list of other qualifications I'm not going to go through at this stage. Today is a partner of Flux Trends. Bronwyn's research focuses on how macro, social, economic trends and emerging technologies will impact businesses, industries and nations in the near and long term future. Part economist and part strategist, Bronwyn's particular area of expertise includes fintech trends, alternative economic models and sustainable future design. So, welcome, Bronwyn. Good morning. So, I'm not going to be talking to you about fashion trends. You clearly know more about that than I do. Instead, what I'm going to be doing today is the taking you through some of the trends emerging in the sustainability economy at the moment. And in particular, hopefully trying to give you some different ways to think about sustainability in, ironically, a more sustainable way. But first, a little bit of a reality check. If those of us can remember and go back in time a little bit to the pre-COVID days, the same month that we went into lockdowns here in South Africa, the UN also started recognizing the world's first climate refugees, which you can see pictured on the screen. These climate refugees were Australian populations and communities that had been displaced due to the massive fires that were taking place in that continent when we were all distracted with what was going down with COVID. So that's, of course, just some background into why sustainability is becoming a real issue as the climate sort of change conversation shifts to being a more climate crisis conversation that we're hearing all the time. In terms of a bellwether in that regard, on the screen over there is Mariana Mazzucato, who is an economist based in the UK at the moment. And she wrote a paper advocating in the middle of COVID that now that we are used to lockdowns for health and safety reasons, we should perhaps also start looking at lockdowns for climate reasons. In other words, shutting down parts of our economies to make sure that the planet has enough room to breathe. And lo and behold, in November last year, India actually implemented its first climate lockdowns, telling people to stay at home because air pollution had got too bad. And London did very similar things with an advisory. It wasn't entirely as strict as the Indian one in January this year, telling people to stay home because it just the world was not a sustainable place for human beings to live, work, and breathe in. So clearly we do have a problem and there's something we have to do about it. The time is imminent. But there's another point that we need to take into consideration about any conversation about sustainability. And that is, of course, social sustainability too. So pictured on the screen are ABBA in their 2021 avatar outfits. They did a comeback to her in the metaverse. And they wore those rather interesting outfits over there. But I've got them on the screen because of their famous song, The Winner Takes It All, which is unfortunately one of those outcomes that we have seen playing out on quite a fractal level across the world and across communities, in that we have seen rich nations getting richer and poor nations getting poorer, big businesses getting bigger, small businesses and middle-sized businesses disappearing, and of course, rich individuals getting much richer than the rest of us. The whole sort of last couple of years going through COVID, it was a very good time to be a billionaire. If you are a billionaire, you have enough money to do things like wasted on buying and messing up Twitter, for example. I mean, like we see this all the time, right? Like there was a lot of money that was made quite unfairly due to the way the world's economy economic sort of systems have been set up in quite unfair ways. If you are an American government, you can do things like give your populations helicopter money to see them through furlough seasons and lockdowns. Our governments, quite frankly, just can't do the same thing or we risk runaway inflation. 
Ironically, of course, their sort of economic policies that were designed to flatten the curve of the economic disruption that came through in COVID have only made our lives more expensive because money doesn't stick to borders. So we're all basically paying more in the grocery stores because Americans got an easier time of it over the last three years. Not very fair, which is why, again, any conversation about sustainability has to talk about both social sustainability and about environmental sustainability at the same time. Which brings us to the donut model, which some of you may have heard about, but others not. And this came from another female economist, Kate Raworth, also based in the UK. And she developed this model of thinking about sustainability, looking at both those constraints, both social sustainability and environmental or natural world sustainability. And it makes sense if you kind of look at that donut picture over there, a donut has two rings, an outer ring and an inner ring. And the outer ring refers to our natural resource bounds that we shouldn't be overshooting in whichever businesses we engage in. It talks about things like, you know, soil quality. Did you know we're running out of sand to, because we've built too many buildings and made too much concrete, for example? It talks about biodiversity. It talks, obviously, about the carbon economy and all of those sorts of things. It's about not taking more than we can put back into the world. But the inner ring of the donut reminds us that we do live in a world where we have people that need to eat and need to grow and need to develop and need to have a future to look forward to. And as such there, she asks us to think about the UN sustainability goals, things like access to education and gender equality and raising people up out of base levels of poverty. And saying then that as businesses, as entrepreneurs, as societies, and as governments that are leading people anywhere, we should make choices that remember those two bounds, reminding us not to overshoot the outer ring of the donut and take more than is really ours of the natural endowments in the world around us, but also to think about not leaving anyone behind or letting anyone fall through the center of the donut below those basic levels of human flourishing that we should be protecting and extending to more and more people. So that's a useful way to frame conversations about sustainability. It's a quadratic equation, not a nice linear simple one. There are trade-offs to be had. But that said, young people around us are certainly not lying down and taking this like lying down flat. When we come to think about this quote that came from a former president of the United States, blessed are the young for they shall inherit the national debts. They will also inherit the international global climate crisis, right? And there's not much they can do about it because, as we do know, politicians are quite old. I read something really interesting a couple of weeks ago that out of the last 10 US presidents, seven of them were born in the 1940s. That means politicians are getting older, which is incredible. And we're not off the hook here in Africa either. In fact, I think we've got some of the oldest average age politicians in the world, despite the fact that we have the youngest population in the world. So the distance between people who are paying the bills of social and environmental instability or unsustainability are not the people that are getting to make the decisions. But within, whenever there's a problem or a challenge, there tends to be an equal and opposite reaction. And there, of course, we can see what's happened with Generation Z, which, of course, Diana and I talk a lot about at Flux. And here in South Africa, they would also be essentially the so-called born-free generation. Essentially, they are the generation that was born post-apartheid from a South African context. In a global context, this is still the generation that is finding their way into the workforce, or not. Quite a lot of them don't want to work at all for the sort of unsustainable systems we have. But that's a different conversation for a different day. But the point is, your future workforce and your future customer is challenging those ideas about young people inheriting unsustainability from decisions made from older people. And we see this, that this generation is much more politically involved and also much more likely not to want to purchase products or interact with brands that are not really both socially and, again, economically and environmentally sustainable. But there's another sort of trend that we see coming up, and that is the rise of the completely willing to bite the hand that feeds generation. This is when Generation Z is finding their way into the workforce and is not loyal to the person who's paying their bills just because that person is paying them a salary at the end of the month. So we're seeing young people actually naming and shaming their employers, the people that pay their salaries, 
which is something previous generations would have kept quiet about. So it's really interesting to us that this generation is actually willing to put their livelihoods on the line to back up their values. So it's something we should take cognizance of as businesses because we've kind of heard these conversations that, you know, from all the big trained agencies, customers want to buy more sustainable products, they want more sustainable brands. But then when you go back to the office, your marketing department pulls up the sort of trend reports, you see that people are still buying all the fast fashion anyway, right? Like no one's really changed their behavior. But we're warning you, that's shifting. This generation is different. They don't just speak and complain about things. They are willing to lose their jobs and their incomes in order to back up their values. They understand the urgency of the situation. And the other thing we're thinking about here is, of course, what's happening with investors. We tend to think about sort of capitalists, capitalists not really caring too much about environmental issues, and it's all about shareholder value and all the rest of it. But this new class of activist investors, both at a retail level and also at the level of investors deciding what businesses to fund, support, and all the rest of it with things like VC money, We've seen quite an interesting shift here. So what you see on the screen is a company called Glow Balance that will actually track your investment portfolio and tell you how your portfolio is contributing to things like climate change, amounts of atmospheric carbon, and all sorts of other issues too. So we start to see that even capitalists are starting to care about this problem for ethical reasons, but also for, again, purely crassly commercial reasons. A really interesting case study that we picked up over there came from Australia, where a young man actually sued successfully his pension fund for vesting his money, his pension fund, into what he deemed to be dirty fossil fuel stocks. But here's the catch. He won the court case not because it was naughty to invest in those bad, destructive companies, but rather because he argued it was not economically sustainable to invest in the past, that a wise financial advisor would be investing his money in industries that would survive into the future. So there's now an economic reason to start aligning those incentives, which again becomes quite interesting. Again, around questions and conversations around sustainability, uh, as Charlie Munger, who's the famous business partner of Warren Buffett, one of the world's most successful long-term and sustainably successful investment companies, as he says, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Or as I like to say, incentives will absolutely eat your best laid intentions for breakfast. You might think that you're trying to put nice policies in place to encourage good behavior, but if you don't think through how human beings like to look for a loophole or a free lunch, you could actually end up doing more harm than good from even policies and decisions that are taken at a corporate level that don't necessarily play out the way you expected in the real world. And I could give you some examples over here, some rather left field examples of unintended consequences that take place from great intentions that just don't play out when people are put into the mix with these sorts of games that we create. The first one would be Domino's Pizza, who famously said if your pizza was delivered cold, you'd get it for free. And then the driver had to carry the cost for not getting it to the customer on time. But what ended up happening was the drivers to meet the time limit started taking chances on the roads and got into more accidents, costing them more money, once again. We can move on to more extreme examples, like some of the strip clubs in America, as depicted by the shiny heels in the other corner, didn't want their customers getting too up close to their girls. They didn't want the girls getting groped by over-eager customers. So what they did is they moved the stage further back from the patrons. But then what happened when it came to tipping, is the men couldn't throw paper money far enough to land on the stage, they started pelting the girls with coins, and they ended up getting bruised, which is just quite funny. And I've got one more example here, which would be depicted by the sheep, and that is that the Welsh have an undeserved reputation as being sheep shaggers, is the word that they're termed to be known as. They have a reputation for bestiality, which is quite a terrible reputation to have. But if you actually look at it, that's not actually the case. Rather, it was an unintended consequence of a bad policy. In Wales, back in the day, the penalty for stealing sheep was death. But the penalty for bestiality was a slap on the wrist. So if you were caught in the field trying to grab your neighbor's sheep, you would just claim that you were there for romantic purposes, not economic ones, and you got away with it, so to speak. But you ended up with a very damaging reputation further down the line. Now, 
And these are all very sort of left of field examples, but they're just designed to get you thinking about how when we make certain decisions that people act in unexpected ways to, to respond to the new constraints, the new sticks and carrots that we put into systems. And what we have to remember is much like chaos theory and the butterfly effect speaks about, that complex systems are complex and that quite often simple solutions don't actually resolve all sides of the problem. And one of the problems that we are seeing here in Africa with responses to the climate crisis and the emergence of the carbon trading economies and the carbon tracking through industrial and B2B supply chains is that Africa to a large extent is finding itself a victim of so-called green lining, which is very similar to red lining, which many of you may be familiar of. Red lining is when banks don't discriminate against you explicitly based on your race or gender, but they do it based on your zip code or your postal code, knowing that people of a particular race and gender do tend to live in those areas. So it's a way to be biased, but kind of get away with it in a gray zone. And what we're seeing with green lining is that quite often international supply chains are using eco policies or like eco scorecards to actually cut other economies out of the supply chain. So at the moment now, more and more industries and whole countries won't do business with you if your supply chain is tainted in any way with being part of the fossil fuel industry. They won't fund your business. They won't, you can't get funding from a bank. You might not even be able to get public relations representation. In fact, the Public Relations Association of the UK has said they won't represent anyone involved in that industry. But there's knock-on effect, right? Because your suppliers' suppliers might be then attached to that. And the other thing is that there is a cost attached, a social cost and a socioeconomic cost to actually complying with quite a lot of the green standards that the likes of the EU has put in place, which means that the EU won't be able to do business with you as a small business in South Africa because your country or your industry doesn't have the requisite credentials or carbon scorecard to trade with them. So again, it's a well-intended policy designed to accelerate the, the fast track to the, to the more sustainable economy, but it does mean that there's a cost that's sort of passed like a pass the parcel game quite often down to the more sort of vulnerable people in communities, either down to actual consumers or down to small businesses or down to weaker economies. And of course, then you've got the whole ESG greenwashing, sort of unintended consequence of various different policies that we put in places to meet those targets in that companies will just quite often outright lie in order to meet those credentials. So we know that at the moment there's a massive backlash from the very activist Generation Z group against your big fast fashion brands, including the likes of H&M, who put up nice recycling displays outside of their shops, but then still encourage you to buy more stuff than you need, and end up with all these clothes. It still ends up in a landfill, although not often in a landfill in Europe, quite often in a landfill here in Africa, or somewhere in a more impoverished community somewhere in Asia. So greenwashing is something we definitely don't want to engage in. We have to be honest about those practices. But it's also worth pointing out that if you actually look at the stocks that are put into those ESG baskets that are claimed to be environmentally, socially, and governance sort of good companies, quite often they're just the biggest companies that are able to hire the best lawyers to actually fill out those scorecards. They're not the most sustainable companies. And here we can use a great local example. We're from a very noble institution the Green Building Council, who denied a company that I work for a green star rating for the building because our garden was too big. Because it wasn't fair on the big companies that had buildings in Santon, right, where they had no green land, which is quite ironic. So actually the <laughs> sort of more sustainable buildings don't get rated because a lot of these systems can be gamed by other systems. So always look under the hood at people who are claiming to meet all these different standards and then challenge it because quite often the legislations and what gets measured and gets managed can actually end up green lining people who are actually doing quite a good job or doing their best to be sustainable. And here, to sort of illustrate that point, I can give you a picture of this gentleman here who runs a petro company in the United States. And he went on a rant, which you can actually find on Biz Community. They had it on their orchards and onions thing that they put out, I think, on Monday mornings. And he went on a rant against the CEO of Patagonia. Because the CEO of Patagonia, which is a very sustainable clothing company, had condemned the petro industry, saying that you know, they were the responsible for everything that's going on in the climate industry in the world and what's going on with climate crisis and the climate catastrophe. And he then went onto the Patagonia website in this rant that he put online, went through their product catalog, 
and showed that almost every item on the Patagonia website was actually a Petro product because they basically have outdoor clothing made out of plastics, right? So he said that this whole idea of sort of picking, blaming certain companies without thinking systemically about how everyone's involved in the consumption process is something that needs to be challenged. And then you had this woman, who some of you might know, Gail Braddock, who is the leader of Extinction Rebellion in the UK. So she runs a lot of those protests against companies that are engaged in climate change. But she was challenged by the guy pointing his finger quite dramatically at her for driving a gas-guzzling diesel sort of SUV around the place. And she counted it saying it's not her fault. The system is what's wrong. Like, it's not her fault that we live in a petro-based capitalist society. She's part of society. She's not responsible for making those choices. So I'll leave you to think about whether that was a good response or a valid response or not. But I can then point you to my favorite author, Terry Pratchett, who says in one of his books that even if it's not your fault, it is actually your responsibility as to what comes next. Your responsibility as a business owner, as an individual, as a consumer, to make choices that are going to make things better, not worse going forward, rather than trying to point blame or to pass the buck and the cost onto someone else. We have to actually get involved with the, as I say, getting skin in the game. You know, you have to actually get out there like Generation Z and put your money or your livelihood perhaps on the line for voting for more of what you actually want in terms of not supporting businesses that are engaged in unsustainable practice, not working for companies that are doing more bad than good in the world. And as a more sort of positive example, we can talk about how that whole ownership of the future economy can trickle down in very interesting ways here in South Africa. One of my favorite examples here would be the Easy Equities community, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. They're the ones that facilitate investing fractionally in fractions of stocks that are listed on the JSE. So I think it's quite a good example of how we can actually invest in more of what we want rather than just trying to complain about things that we don't want. We have to actually put our action behind us. And the wonderful thing over here is that when we start to do that, when we start to invest with our time, with our attention, with the clicks that we do, with the products that we buy, all those many votes that we have every day, with really every rand that we spend or invest, when we invest in good things, those good things, odds of them succeeding increase. Whereas when we don't, the odds of them succeeding actually diminish. So in that regard, whether we're sort of positive or negative, either way, we really are right. We need to back our opinions and our values by our time and our values and our actual cash values behind it. Now, if that's a bit challenging for you, we're also seeing on the sort of more trend space, the trend toward personal carbon credit tracking. Companies already have to do this, as I explained, in terms of those sort of ESG scorecards they have to fill out. They're now becoming actually legislation here on a stock exchange. You can't actually list a company with the, the JSC unless you actually submit a carbon scorecard or an ESG scorecard along with your other sort of audit processes and all the rest of it. So companies are used to that. But now we're seeing consumers also taking an active interest in their own footprint, taking personal responsibility once again. And here, one of the earliest examples would be MasterCard, which released that black card just before COVID, actually. And it's a credit card that has two different credit limits on it. It's got your regular credit limit based on how much money the bank can think that you can reliably pay back to them if it lends to you. But it's also got another voluntary limit based on your carbon footprint. Because basically, we now know with all data what the carbon footprint almost everything that we purchase is, whether it's airline tickets, clothing, food, transport, whatever it may be. And when you've exceeded your voluntary carbon credit limit, your credit card actually cuts off and you can't spend anymore. So that was a really interesting sort of self sort of incentive to do good. And the other one would be the likes of Sheep Inc., which is a clothing brand in the UK, which was, I think, one of the very first clothing companies to actually put the carbon footprint into their clothing labels, along with the sort of the, car, the, the cloth composition and the washing instructions. You actually got a, this is the actual real cost, the externalities of the goods that you're buying. There's now companies also in South Africa that popped up that have been sending me their press releases that will track your grocery purchases at the till and will tell you, again, give you a carbon receipt as well as a cash receipt to say, what impact the things that you're purchasing have on the world around you. But this whole idea of people being more aware of what they're purchasing is going to have massive implications for businesses that are trying to sell to this new, very politically engaged generation. 
And then also on the more positive sense, we can see that some businesses are trying to put skin in the game and not just pass the back on. Back on. And the Gucci CEO's a challenge to actually go carbon neutral to other CEOs, not to pass it on to their employees or onto their customers, is quite an interesting example of that. And he started that in 2019 and got a whole lot of other CEOs to pledge to do the same thing. And then, of course, very similar to the carbon credit card that I showed you that was a voluntary limits on your own impact on the world, we're also seeing businesses now engaging in sustainability-linked loans. So with a sustainability-linked loan, if you fail to meet your own voluntary ESG targets as a company, your interest rates on your loan increase. And Woolworths and Standard Bank were the first ones to do that here in South Africa. So these ideas of sort of self-accountability are coming to the fore, and it's definitely one of the more positive trends that we've seen. But now let's go back to the donut and talk about the trade-off that people like to talk about in terms of environmentalism and the economy. Now, I don't know about you, but we all live in Africa, and quite frankly, the idea of degrowth or the idea of shrinking the proverbial donuts in order to meet sustainability challenges is quite frankly untenable in a country where you've still got children who don't have flushing toilets at school, right? We have to retain some ability to think about growing the donut, but still respecting those two bounds, the environmental bounds and, of course, the social bounds too. But we have to then talk about how we can talk about or how we can think about sustained growth. And ironically, when you think about sustainability as a concept, there are kind of two different dictionary definitions of sustainability. The one is to sort of sustain, which is to maintain, which is to be in a holding pattern or a degrowth pattern. Much like if you hold down a note on a piano or on a guitar, it sustains and it sort of diminishes over time. And that's not actually sustainable over time. That's an evolutionary dead end. But there's another type of sustainability, which is sustainability with growth. This is evolutionarily fit sustainability, which talks about changing so that we can do more with less, which has always been the story of human progress. So I do think that when you go into conversations around sustainability, we should be also coupling those conversations with conversations around technology and progress, rather than around conversations around degrowth and actually doing with less going forward, rather thinking of ways to be sustainable about growing, about improving lives, and about increasing human flourishing and actually raising that floor of the inner ring of the donut. And there are some interesting ways to think about that, looking at future trends as well as past trends too. And the one example here, we can think about what's going on in the metaverse space, which of course gets a lot of flack as it should. And of course, a lot of people are quite gleeful about what's happened in the crypto community over the last couple of weeks and months, as a lot of that sort of fake money has flushed out of the system. But the whole metaverse economy should give us something to think about, particularly in the world of apparel and trends in that conspicuous consumption and fast fashion is actually not sustainable. But this fashion industry can be sustainable. The ability to express yourself creatively using the new digital channels is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And this idea that you can purchase digital skins and have a different outfit on your Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok feed every single day without having to actually purchase and own those products is an interesting concept to play with. So we've seen this in the real world with the likes of the Rent the Runway type products where you can have an infinite closet and you never have to own those things that end up at a landfill. But we also see it now with the rise of digital fashion, which very big brands are getting involved with. And it's such a creative space, which I think has been used very badly to date. The technology allows amazing things but the actual designs that you can download as skins and filters from the likes of Fabricant and Dressex are quite frankly just silly and they make you look kind of ridiculous when you put those filters onto your social media platforms. But the challenge is out there to explore these ideas because it's a way to have fast fashion but without the economic or the environmental impact that it currently does right now. And for other examples that are already here in the here and now about turning the sort of proverbial lemons of the carbon crisis into proverbial lemonade, Involve the rise of the air economy, which is a really interesting space. And it's a way of kind of turning trash into actual cash. And it's not just in the recycling sense. We've already seen this in the likes of Sandton City, where you can take your recycling and actually have a reverse vending machine, get cash out from the machine, or putting in your trash. 
We've also seen it in the likes of more sort of progressive fashion brands, the likes of Allbirds that makes basically the slip slops, that took the trash from the Great Pacific Garbage, garbage Patch, which is basically plastic fishing rope, and turned it into high-end apparel, which is interesting. And then you've got brands that are solving the actual atmospheric carbon issue and turning it into economic profit. And Airco, which you can see pictured on the screen there, was one of the forerunners in this space. What they do is they take atmospheric carbon and they convert it into alcohol, which can be used to make premium vodka, like you can see pictured, or to make cleaning supplies. Other companies like Nestle, right here in South Africa, are taking atmospheric carbon and converting it into baking soda, which you can now buy in the shops, which is quite incredible. And still others are thinking even further ahead using even more advanced technology and taking that same atmospheric carbon, that waste, that problem, and turning it into protein that can be used to feed people, almost like literal biblical manna from heaven, which is really quite incredible. So I've given you a lot to think about, hopefully, about the topic of sustainability, and I hope that you'll see it as an opportunity, and not as a problem, as something that can be solved positively and that can actually uplift people in our communities, not just be used as a sort of stick to punish people for and making, uh, try and encourage people to make their lives kind of smaller. So next time you have a conversation about sustainability, let's talk about putting growth back on the table. And I'm going to hand back to the organizers, or if there's anyone that has questions on the floor, we do have a bit of time to take them now. Anyone got a question, comment? There's a mic at the back. There's some good. Hi, Bronwyn. Uh, thank you. That was really insightful. I just made a comment about something. And so um, the lead-in would be the story about H&M, um, who I think have these like guilt-free placebos in terms of these boxes where you can give back merchandise, right? But, I mean, in, and I'm only speaking from a fashion context, but so you have this life cycle analysis done of these things. And basically, a, if you hand in a pair of jeans, um, it's equivalent to the same as upcycling into a new pair. So what I'm trying to say or, try, uh, or what are comments I really wanted to make, and exactly with Patagonia you said, which has now removed the word sustainable from any of their descriptions, yeah. is that there doesn't seem to be a standardized language framework um, deciphering what brands are actually meant to be doing or, or describing how they're doing this and how dangerous it is. And I've definitely seen it within the South African context, a huge amount of greenwashing awards going mm. out to people, and this has not really been... It's not helping. It's yeah, not it's really helping, yeah. And um, so this concept of recycling is uh, that less than 1%, I think this came out from the UN kind mm. of alliance in fashion, um, of anything is recycled into new garments. And using recycled fibers, fabrics doesn't really mean that these fa fibers that you're using long term are sustainable and won't have a negative impact on the community. But I think going back to it, what do you think about um, the issue around transparency and how important that's going to be in the fashion industry? Oh, it's got to be one of the most critical things, that absolute transparency, but throughout that sp supply chain. I think that what brands need to be aware of is that it can be tracked and traced now. One thing the DeFi community has given us, whether, whether you're interested in crypto or not, is this concept of tracking things all the way through the supply chain on essentially kind of blockchain type ledgers, even if it's not a blockchain itself. The idea that every piece of value or any negative value, any negative externalities can and will be tracked, traced, measured and monitored, if not by your customers, by somebody else's anti-customers, as I'm calling them. These are the sort of activists who would never purchase your product, but are quite happy to trash your brand nonetheless, right? There are a lot of, there's a lot of sort of vigilantes looking out there at the moment. And this ability to hide things is disappearing. We have unfortunately incentivized companies to greenwash, to put up literally like H&M did, like green posters, like in their shops to say, oh, it's green now, right? To sort of trick people. And that worked for a little while, but it's not working anymore. And it's particularly not working because those costs of carbon impacts are being calculated everywhere, which means that the cost is now coming to me as a consumer. Some companies in the UK, for example, during COVID, when they found their staff were working remotely, 
they figured that they could do home inspections and then use the state or the, in, the eco-friendly, like where they've got double glazed windows, where they've got a gas stove or, or a wood stove or whatever in their homes, to contribute to their carbon scorecard, which the company did and got those points. But now the, cust the, the, the employee, that end user, that person, now knows they're being tracked and traced too. So they're also looking at ways to reduce their score by passing it on to the next person, which means everything does come home to roost eventually. I think the era of easy greenwashing is going to rapidly come to an abrupt end. But in terms of what Brian's going to be doing about it, I think that it comes back to the idea of putting your own skin in the game and not trying to pass the buck on to someone else. You have to build your own circular supply chain. You have every, every touch point that you have within your community, with your customers, with your workers, how it works, you need to look at that. And I think that we are seeing some interesting examples there of brands, whether it's like upcycling sort of certain types of clothing and like letting the, the style be slightly adjusted by in-house seamstresses so that next season people can continue to wear it, or whether it's actually dismantling those garments and reusing that, that cloth. I think it has to sort of come back to the actual brand to see how far they're willing to invest in that whole thing. So that idea of not thinking about this, the circular economy as a whole, which is totally overwhelming, but talking about how can you create a circular supply chain for your own business. And we've seen that in the food space with the likes of Loop, for example, and the rise of all those grocery stores around here that you have to bring your own containers in, that you don't, you don't get a plastic bag and all of that. So those sorts of things are taking place and people are looking for those stories too. So see it as an opportunity. It's a marketing opportunity, not just at the cost. Yeah. Morning. Thank you so much. Very informative and insightful. Uh, I want to find out your carbon scorecard. Where did you get that from? There's a, I think the company here is called Carbron. I think they started doing a trial with uh, checkers, but there's also a carbon calculator, like literally .com, that you can go to that'll give you a good indication. And quite often, you don't have to do these things yourself because we're starting to see coming onto packaging, much like you can see the calories. So you've got carb counting in terms of your carbohydrates, but now you've also got carb counting in terms of your carbon that you're starting to see on packaging labels in grocery stores. This is not here in South Africa too much yet, but the likes of the sort of carbon companies that are coming in that will give you that calculator are a signal, signal that this is going to be available everywhere. And already you can see on your airline tickets, if you fly with almost any of the domestic airlines, you'll get a carbon calculation printouts at the bottom of your tickets and asking asking if you want to do the offsetting there. So these things are there, you start to look for them and notice them. And the fact that the JSC is now demanding basic ESG auditing and accounting along with financial sort of stability accounting, which is obviously a, a no-brainer when it comes to listing stocks on the stock exchange, is indication that that's going to be passed on throughout all different parts of those supply chains and get to us quite quickly. Uh, we've got a question. We had a question here. Hello. Okay. Um, first of all, you look great. <laughs> um, I just wanted to comment on sustainability as a whole in the context of South Africa. Um, obviously, our poverty rate is very high. So, do you think that sustainability is inclusive um, as far as Obviously, if we're talking about H&M, H&M has a very specific mm. target market, you know, all of that, um, which many people in more impoverished areas cannot reach. So the thought yeah. of sustainability is not even in their headspace. Um, so it also goes back to what you said about responsibility and whose responsibility is it if not the bigger companies, especially um, companies that provide services and provide clothes and whatnot, to those less impoverished, I'm going to say PIP, for example. Mm. PIP does not, I, I haven't seen any a sustainability, sustainability strategy from PIP, quote yeah. around it, but like that, who's supposed to reach those people who, um, I want to say, for them to get to a point where sustainability is a choice yeah. and not just something that was told and pushed down on them? 
Well, yes, that's a, that's a very, very good point because sustainability is entirely unfair. I mean, like we spoke, I spoke about the green lining at a sort of international country-based level. But the point is that you have to think about this like in economic terms. We talk about a quadratic equation being a curve that has like a, like a hump in it, right? It's, a, it's an equation that can't be maximized just for sustainability or you're actually going to make the lives of real human beings much worse in the short term. Like, can you really judge someone that barely earns enough money to put food on the table for purchasing from an unsustainable retailer? You know, like whether it's an H&M or whether it's a Sheen or whatever the case is. You absolutely cannot because that's where Gail Braddock does have a point. They're part of a system, right? It's the system that's the problem. It's not just the person that's within it. So we have to look at balancing those needs. But I think it comes down again to looking at individuals rather than trying to impose middle-class morality onto people that, quite frankly, just can't afford those things right yet, right now. But it's about if you do have a position of privilege, if you do have a company, if you do have an organization, are you making sustainable choices or are you making unsustainable choices? The other challenge to, I think, a lot of people in the room here is the concept of insourcing again rather than outsourcing because if we sort of bringing more jobs back onto the continent back into our country we will have less poor people which means they won't be won't be having to make these sorts of choices right so we have to start thinking about this from a from a many zoomed out perspective these are not simple problems and my challenge always with a lot of the sustainability conversations are coming from a rich european point of view where you don't have extreme poverty where you have the luxury of being able to purchase sustainably at a much larger scale. We're not there yet. We have to balance the ideals of growth and poverty alleviation with sustainability in the long run. And then, of course, there's the other challenge, which is the fact that Africa is going to bear the brunt of the global climate crisis in terms of water and energy security going and food security going forward, even though we're not necessarily responsible at a international scale for the most contribution to the climate crisis. So it's a very complicated question to unpack in many ways. I would encourage us not to be judgmental about other people's purchasing behavior. I would encourage us to be very responsible about our own purchasing behavior, right? Because that's, that's how we have to start. We can't point fingers here because it's not a simple choice for most people. So that's not very helpful, but you know. I am an economist, this is always on the other hand. One more question. Okay, my question is regards with policy, uh, yeah. because you've also, you know, showed us the unintended consequences that are brought by policies. How do we, um, from the ground, get to contribute in terms of how policy can be shaped in a way that uh, it talks to um, sustainability in terms of growth? Yeah, I think we've got, to, we've got to exercise that agency as citizens and participate in democracy. Obviously, that's the only way that we can do it. Unfortunately, a lot of the policy that is set is set by bigger organizations and is set to suit them. This is why ESG scorecards are so easy to fudge, right? You can, like, offset that carbon here. I mean, Discovery is supposed to be one of our most sustainable businesses. I mean, like, they don't need that office. You know, like, you can, you can plant as many trees as you like. That concrete's already been used, right? That sand is gone. Like, you can't, you can't sort of, like, pass that, pass that egg back. But I think that's... Um, like, if you are engaged with, with politics, we need to be asking these questions and not thinking about these things in linear terms, thinking about them in more abstract terms across all the different stakeholders that are involved and not forgetting the people behind this because we have hungry people. We have people that have issues that have to pay bills at the end of the month that we can't forget about. So I think we have to challenge these ideas and just ask more questions. I mean, I'm not a politician at all. But if you are lucky enough to be close to the centers of power, ask more questions. Always ask why are we doing these things. So it's why both, why are we continuing to do things we've done in the past when they're not working, but also why do we want to break things down? Have we really thought about whether those, those sort of levers or those safety nets were there for an actual reason? So just ask more questions and, and hold space to have these conversations because that's why I have these sorts of conversations that touch on a lot of uncomfortable points because people can get very sort of personal about issues around sustainability and become almost religious in conversations. We try to put people into good and bad buckets. Look rather at the ands, not just the ors, and look at a lot of the sort of shade in between a lot of these conversations. And let's just, let's just ask questions and let's be open. And let's not forget about people that don't have the ability to make the same privileged choices that we have. So again, not very helpful, but I'm, I'm a trained analyst. <laughs> Thank you very much. We do one more. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, Uminati Lamini. 
Um, I just want to ask, as we are here, all of us, and as you stated that in Africa, there is a trend of having older people in power and looking into the future, they won't be there when we have to deal with the repercussions. Um, so in essence, um, I would just like to ask, as we're sitting here, what is the like, small things that we can do in our everyday lives um, that can change the way that we live and become a green humanity, like, a, like as a human race? Not That's like a very big question. <laughs> Well, it comes back to my concept of you got to you got to put your money where your mouth is. You got to vote for the things you want more of, and like you can't just talk about it. You have to actually do it. What what are you purchasing with your money? Which companies are you supporting? Who are you working for? Who are you voting for? When it goes to the polls, you're voting for parties that have elderly gentlemen in charge. I mean, like America is a joke at the moment. You know how old they're? They sort of candidates are. It's like absolutely ridiculous. Are they even going to be alive by the end of the term? Never mind the, sort of, for the consequences of their actions. There's a, there's a problem there. Like, don't support those those ideas. So you can't you can't even tacitly support them because that's another conversation we have quite often in these sort of future conversations. Is that doing nothing or sort of opting out doesn't actually help solve the problem. But it's not about saying that you're solely responsible for these things, but you're only responsible for your own choices. And understand that, quite frankly, whichever articles you click on, whichever sort of catalogs you browse, that's making those people more powerful and having more space in the, in the, in the conversation. So it's as simple as what feeds are you following, which brands are you liking, even if you can't afford to buy from them, what companies are you buying from? Have you interrogated the companies that you're buying from? Like, have you asked the questions if they're not actually publishing sort of sustainability reports, right? But these, are, these are things we can do as consumers, as shareholders, as employees. Again, that generation activist trend is, is a really interesting one to see play out because you are being asked to, to call to account just, by, just through transparency, just asking for information is I think the first thing we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. That was extremely insightful. We're going to go to the second part of our program, which is the Trends 2023 panel discussion. And I'm going to introduce our facilitator this morning. Gavin Roger is a South African-based designer out of Cape Town that specializes in handcraft garments that are made with the finest fabrics and craftsmanship. The brand is synonymous with luxury, having shown in Paris during the courtier of a few, for a few previous years and elsewhere in the world. He has set up a base with a strong team of artisans. The Cape Town-based atelier services discerning clients and wanting to personalize their service and clothing made for couture standards. Underpinning the success of the brand is a passion for assisting women in vulnerable communities and offering them sustainable employment and teaching them skills. Gavin is an outspoken champion of child and human rights. He's a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador and focus on programs that end violence against children. In addition, Gavin is also an ambassador to the Gift of the Givers, and he sits on the advisory board for Africa for Harvard University. Thank you, welcome Gavin. really got to do something with changing these pictures. They don't seem to keep up with my age at all. Um, I want to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come here today and be part of this. Um, and I can't believe so many people woke up early enough to come here. I certainly wouldn't have. But um, I've made a whole lot of notes, and I think what I'd like to do is I'm going to be, it's not just going to be me. And the way I'd like to kind of run things, I know they've given me a briefing document, but you know me, I don't really follow those things too well. But um, I think um, I'm going to be joined by very, uh, two very amazing and luminaries in South African fashion, and they're known for various things. Um, and actually, one actually not really South African, more on the continent. Uh, and an iconic designer in her own right, from her own country of Cameroon, Crayon. 
Um, so I'd like to, without any further delay, invite Philippe Mazibuko, I'm sure, who needs very, very little introduction. He's a stalwart in the South African fashion industry. He's known for mentoring the most incredible designers, people in allied fashion industries. He's a great talent himself in terms of a creative director, and he'll be joining us in terms of our conversation we have today. Um, the next designer I, who is going to be joining us on this panel is someone who I um, have a great amount of respect for her in terms of her work, and um, her brand is Crayon, and I've, I've, we've done many shows around the world over many times before, and I've always admired her kind of unstinting passion for representing her country and for extending the traditional skills that her country has into kind of a very contemporary and modern language in terms of fashion. And um, I would like to invite her on board so we can continue a discussion and take it onto the continent. So I, I thought the last speaker was super interesting in terms of the, the macro trends in terms of what's happening in the world, but maybe not necessarily very specifically targeted towards the industry we are kind of really immersed in, which is fashion. And I thought we should start, I'm going to start off with some comments, which I had made. And so many of you might know, or might not know, I started a, a program in the last two years where the focus is really looking at sustainable fashion. Everybody uses that word sustainable. In fact, it should be banned because it's actually a lot of lies in the fashion industry, to be honest. Um, few brands have sustainable credentials. And this is, there's a lot of reasons. And I think one of the things which we didn't address in the last one was why is the fashion industry so bad at it? So I'm going to make a few comments around it, and um, it's very lucky actually to present a paper in Harvard this year in terms of sustainability and fashion, and um, to look at why we're still stuck, not just us, but globally. And obviously, we f we're part of a global industry, so the same kind of reasons impact us. So I think when you look at terms like recycling, reusing, resale, rental, repair, these come how, somehow intrinsically connected to this concept of sustainability. And they're sold as environmental savers. So, but I'll give you some very interesting stats to show you how these things, over the last, we've had 25 years of discussion in the industry talking about it. It's become a big thing now in terms of Gen Z, but even Gen Z goes and puts their stuff in H&M baskets and doesn't really question things until real NGOs pursued this discussion further. So over the last 25 years, the fashion industry has had the most minimal impact in terms of this conversation globally. And why? Because there's an unrelenting pursuit of growth in terms of fashion globally. Everything is about sales, everything is about figures, everything is about instant demand. And so in the last century, we've literally doubled the production of shirts, clothing, footwear, right? Um, and what do you think? That in the last 25 years, we have had the most minimal impact because three-quarter of this kind of, of this consumption that is pr produced or we think is going to be consumed is either burned or buried. So these are the statistics that I think you need to be very aware of. Um, and then you, under you start understanding the impact it has in terms of cl you know, climate change, number one, the impact on the environment. And also, you know, very interesting, and I'm glad uh, Bronwyn had mentioned it, was this concept of this Bronwyn the, I was going to call it a pronut <laughs> uh, of do, this donut concept, right? Pronut, bronut, donut. So, uh, th and that's really important because people often forget this. We are on an African continent. And being on this African continent 
There are far more important things. Women are getting beaten up, raped, murdered. Our levels of violence escalate. Nutrition escalates. The use of fossil, fossil fuel still continues. And given our situation with ESCOM, you know, you're more likely to burn a tree uh, to cook dinner. So this consumption of fashion, which is cheap, is a huge issue, right? And, uh, you know, very interesting thing. If you look at the prices comparatively from the 1990s to now, fast fashion and footwear has decreased. The, the, the cost of it has decreased. So there's a huge amount of consumption. And, you know, I'm not sure. Bronwyn kind of touched on petro, petro, petro. But these are the use of non-biodegradable petroleum-based synthetics are important. Because you can say, okay, I'll go and recycle this plastic bottle and create the swimwear. But are you going to use that swimwear for 100 years or most likely chuck it away in two years' time? So those were very interesting things. And the big thing on the continent I'm going to lead into this is, or the discussion is also, we are very, it's a very expensive process. To produce recyclable fabrics is very expensive. And also, nobody talks about how much water is used. So, you know, water is going to be the next big thing in terms of what we're going to be impacted with in the global. So, in fact, when you're buying something which is recycled or made sustainably, it's a new product. Uh, thank you, Yaya. Hello. You're distracting me. Um, so, basically, I think what's really... The, this thing is of greenium. And greenium is premium product, which is kind of greenium, uh, green, basically. So you get, you're now looking at places or which are mass retailers like Primark are saying, for three and a half dollars, you can get a T-shirt, which is a greenium product. And those are new companies who are leading a discussion in terms of how you can make green products accessible. This issue of circularity is important in terms of an economy and an economy that supports one another because the other issue in South Africa and globally is what makes it difficult to do this is that we don't own the entire value chain of production. So you're not able to control whether your CMT is abusive in terms of the use of water, electricity, you know, and again, this donor thing or the Brona thing is, uh, is about are you paying your workers fairly? You know, is it ethically sourced? Those are the other conversations we're in this. And this issue of transparency is very important. Um, I just wanted to give you one last statistic. Uh, less than 1% of garments are recycled into new garments. So there's this talk but nobody actually understands the actual facts around it. You know, we, we, if you heard the last kind of positioning about it, it sounds like, wow, we've got all these, these things in place. But actually, we don't even have a legislation, and we don't even have a framework. So, leading into that, I'd like to start with asking um, Anna, uh, on your thoughts in terms of perhaps giving us an understanding from your positioning in Cameroon, what are the initiatives that have possibly been done to kind of mitigate this or to embrace either climate change and or sustainability? Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, sorry for my English. I'm a French speaker, so I just try to, to make myself... Parlez français? Oui, je parle français. Je suis beaucoup plus à l'aise. Mais il n'y a personne pour faire la traduction, donc... Euh... <rire> euh, assez compliqué. Ok, pas mais c'est super, c'est super, je ne le savais pas. Donc, vous pouvez reprendre la question en français, alors, c'est mieux. Ok, oui, mm -hmm. un petit peu. Ok. So, je parle quoi, français ou... Euh... Anglais. Anglais. D'accord, ok. If it gets tricky, we go into French, and then it'll be very tricky when I start translating. Ah, ok. Et donc, donc la question était quoi en français? C'était quoi en français alors? C'était quoi la question? Ok. C'était, je, je réponds en anglais. Ok. C'était quoi la question? Mm. C'était quoi la question? Um, so, 
I'm going to have to keep it in English uh -huh. because I think it's going to be difficult. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you have issues, mm -hmm. respond in French and I will try. Or maybe call upon assistance somewhere in the back there to assist. Is someone? Yeah, perhaps, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come. Fantastic. There yeah, you go. Thank you so much. That'll be better. Much, much, much. Yeah. I don't want to mix your words up. Hi. <laughs> Okay, so I want you to. Uh, so we want to know exactly in the context of uh, Cameroon, what are the maybe things that they are being done there, which mitigates or contributes to lessening kind of, you know, the impacts of climate change and or contributing to towards creating a sustainable or greener kind of environment in terms of fashion production. So, en fait, dans le, au Cameroun, qu'est-ce qui a pu être fait depuis euh, le temps en termes pour la mode et tout en termes de euh, comment dire, sustainability et d'écosystème par rapport à la mode et par rapport également à, à, à tout l'écosystème, donc tous les challenges qu'il y a par rapport à là-bas. Ok. Euh, en tant que designer euh, camerounaise et d'Afrique centrale, euh, c'est toujours un, un honneur et un plaisir de venir en Afrique du Sud parce que euh, c'est vrai qu'on est en Afrique, mais on est très, 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 très loin de ce qui se passe ici. Moi, j'ai la chance en tant que designer de voyager, de sortir, euh, de voir ce qui se passe ailleurs. Mais tous les concepts dont on parle ici sont vraiment très éloignés de, de notre réalité locale. Donc, nous, on est encore vraiment... Uh, Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as a designer from Cameroon and from Central uh, Africa, it's always a big honor and a big pleasure for, for me to come and uh, in South Africa because we can really see the gap because from the, the, the perspective of uh, our country in Central Africa, West Africa, we are so far behind and here it's so evolved. And to see the, the problematics that we can encounter here, Uh, they are far beyond what we are facing because we have uh, struggles and uh, we are facing many more issues uh, in terms of development and in terms of uh, vision in, uh, for sustainability. Donc, euh, j'allais juste dire que donc euh, aujourd'hui, en fait, moi, ce que je peux dire par rapport à tout ça, c'est que euh, le concept de, de la durabilité, de sustainability, peut être pour nous une opportunité, en fait. Uh, for us, uh, definitely, the notion of sustainability and durability is a big opportunity, as we are really coming from afar. Uh, there is really a room, a big room for growth and uh, interest. Merci. So... That's great. I mean, it's interesting to hear that um, and the concept of durability around it. So, Philippe, I think what is, uh, I mean, you're more au fait in terms of context of like South Africa. And um, so one of the very interesting things are kind of looking at what designers and local brands should be doing in terms of creating this vision for a greener future. And I want to say something which people don't say or don't automatically include. Sustainability is not an overnight thing. It's a long-term vision. It's a long-term goal. And I think quite often we speak in very generic terms. So I wanted to, and you, and you mentor a huge amount of young people in the industry, so I wanted to know your take on that. <coughs> Sorry. I think for me the most important thing, you have to start with the foundation. I think because there are no... Bodies, for instance, we don't have a South African Fashion Council that governs or... It's not like South this a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with the foundation. We need to have those type of bodies before we can even jump into big words like sustainability, where there are stakeholders within the clothing text and textile industry, within all the stakeholders that are responsible for everything that everyone wears. So then there can be sustainable rules that help sustainability get to a new level of, 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 of maturity and understandability. Great. I think that, that I mean, you know, um, I know it's not on my briefing thing, but uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's an exceptionally important thing that there is no body to the state in our country that is a cohesive voice of the fashion industry. And that is a huge issue, but largely also ourselves to blame because we don't speak up. 
Uh, I don't think it's not, it's, it's not about speaking up. It's about it's about the education within systems of of creative schools that 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 they have to build. But you think it's a school issue? you think it's a school's responsibility? I think before? education. It, I think education is very important in understanding law in the first place, no. in understanding how to stand up and speak for yourself. I totally agree so with you. So for me, there should be some kind of curriculum within creative schools where they are focusing on creative speaking and having their methodologies understood with, in, in every genre of their businesses. Okay, that, I, mean, that, that, I mean, for the longest time I've been shot down because I can't stand to think of people taking sewing machines to school every day. And we have people charging a fortune where kids have to take their sewing machines to school. So what you're asking is a huge task for many of these people, and I'm dealing with a project called Futurewear. It's a practical application or an immersive incubator for people who come out of school. And they don't get taught these things. But I do think the, the, the responsibility of forming an organization doesn't lie within the school. The responsibility of forming an organization lies within an industry. And that industry is the one that needs, you know, you, you're hearing about these sector plans from government. How many of you have been included in the development of the sector plan? Where's your voice in the sector plan? Yeah, but within the sector plan, there has to be some kind of basic education that allows you to have a voice. And I think a lot of creatives, especially designers, they don't have a voice because they were never taught to have a voice. They were taught to sew. That's the reason they carry sewing machines to, to, to school every day. And for me, fundamentally, if you don't teach someone to stand up for themselves and mentor them to stand up for themselves, then there's no basis in growth. I totally get that, but I don't think that it's actually a unique thing to South Africa. I think that it's a, it's a thing in terms of the, and you're right, it's approach to teaching. I think it's very interesting. But if you look at platforms like this, this is a private sector platform that's being created. Government doesn't do these things. And if they do do it, they do it in a very kind of, you know, well, let's not, let me not go more into more flowery descriptions. But I absolutely do get it. But I think it's a very important discussion, maybe, to, if you look at the future in terms of thinking of how fashion is taught. Uh, I think and that's and I think beyond that, beyond how there's no voice that speaks for the, for the fashion designers, I really think within the Department of Arts and Culture and within the Department of Trade and Industry, there should be some kind of person who can literally sit down there and come up with a document to help young designers to speak to them about everything and to make them understand the whole value chain of production. Because for me, it starts from, the, from, from, from trade. If you don't understand trade, then you can understand laws. I do, I do agree with that. And I think it's a very valid point. And I definitely think you should be working for the DTI. <laughs> I really do think so. Uh, I've tried to have conversations with them. It, it, it kind of goes over their heads. So moving on to other things, I mean, quite clearly there's a lot to cover in a very short space of time. So I think that was a very important thing in terms of the next trend that comes up in, in terms of what are the kind of trends moving forward in terms of technology. And I think globally there's this huge uh, shift towards looking at tech and how tech is going to influence the future of fashion. And obviously, everybody's heard about the metaverse. I was just at MIT in the US, and they've got something called the Eraverse coming mm. out. So there are all these new kind of uh, spaces in a, in a digital sphere, which now is kind of trying to propel fashion forward. So you know, many things like digital showrooms, live stream shopping, wearables, cryptocurrencies, which have burnt many people's fingers. Uh, but at the same time still in some forms continue to flourish. And how does that actually impact us on the continent? Um, and it seems like a very far off discussion, but perhaps it's the new way in terms of how we get African fashion really out there. Because we are dealing with so many other issues, like we can have websites, we can have accessibility on the web, but we can't necessarily always have sales driven on the web because of a huge other kind of issues like logistics. Now, will kind of things like um, not just cryptocurrencies and blockchain, what do you think that the impact is going to be for the future? And do you, I mean, are you as a designer, for instance, in Cameroon accepting 
payments in cryptocurrency and if you aren't, why aren't you? Okay. Actually, no. The, uh, in Cameroon, we don't accept uh, crypto, okay. crypto money, but it's... Um, it's getting there. Yeah, it's getting... We are thinking about yeah, that. Yeah. So I think it may be a good, a good thing. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on I, I find that I'm, keep on, I'm going to keep on coming back to the same kind of thing where we have to lay a basis of education. I really think that everyone is so insta-ready, but they are not informed about how economics of creativity works. So for me, it is important how we step back from taking that instant moment and, and really educate ourselves in how to sell and market businesses in the first place. I think more than anything, I think even from, from, from corporate to banks, there is no friendly system that handles creative people. When creative people want to get a loan, when creative people want to buy a house, when they want to buy a car, there's always issues underlying that. And for me, again, it's just going back to education. So we cannot even, even entertain cryptocurrency when it comes to the creative industries. For me, it's just a huge, it's just a, a phallus. So for me, we have to again go back into switching off our cell phones and educating ourselves in how can we now, from buying that cotton, from buying that zip, from dyeing that fabric, from getting the graphic designer, from you sourcing and, and, and your transportation money, all that cannot be crypto at this point in time. We have to start with the value chain and understanding that first. I mean, I hear you, and I really hear you about placing this emphasis on education, education, education. But the also, you know, I remember starting my own business, and I had to do a lot of these things on my own. I mean, the, the, the responsibility doesn't just lie on a third party. It has to be within you. Yeah, but I mean, I was hosting a lunch yesterday with 20 Media yeah. and having a discussion with them, and I was like, you are responsible for making the housewives of whoever fashion icons. You are responsible for badly dressed people because you feature these people and you think this is how fashion should be. You are responsible for creating this culture of people borrowing things from young people and not actually paying them. So there's not this trade-off. But I don't believe that everything relies on the fact of a third party. You, at some point, as an individual, creative individual, as an entrepreneur, have to wake up, grab it by, your, by the collar and say, right, guys, this is what I actually have to do. Prayan, you want to say something? Yeah, too? I want to say it about us. We, we, we have finished uh, our training. We are now in the entrepreneurship. So maybe we don't have to time to go back to... So how do we deal with uh, what's happening Modern now? Things, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it, it's not even about dealing that. I find that there's a lot of fashion illiteracy in terms of from the consumer end. Yeah. And if the consumer is fashion illiterate, what about the designer? For me, fundamentally, when you start your business, you have to surround yourself with, with amazing people. Yeah. The, first, with the first important thing that you need, you need a, a good accountant. And if you can't be selling in crypto, your accountant is going to teach you how to sell in crypto. Then after that, you need a good lawyer. Before you even go anywhere, all those papers need to be in intact. So those are the fundamentals that these type of platforms are supposed to be encouraging, are supposed to be engaging within the other stakeholders, within the fashion industry. I absolutely agree with you. I've been uh, going to have meetings with banks and, and challenging banks. Yeah. And challenging banks who don't look at credentials. I mean, I've never, I don't have any fashion credentials, as in a, a, a degree or a diploma or whatever. I mean, I said something completely different. But I feel people, I mean, I don't want to name the bank, but I've been having a conversation about the bank who's only accepting graduate professionals and if they have a degree and they're not recognizing any fashion degrees. And talking about compliance, um, you know, so one of the big four accounting firms is another one I've been having a discussion with is how do you assist young uh, entrepreneurs, emerging entrepreneurs to be compliant, to be able to move forward? And again, this discussion with the DTI, which you could, I mean, I've never taken a cent from government ever. Uh, but it's amazing how so many, so few people, like, well, a chosen few, have kind of bypassed all these very rigid uh, kind of conditions and manage to get this funding. But young people or emerging entrepreneurs are not able to do this as such. 
But I suppose we're digressing a little bit. I can see Hannah Lee's looking at me very rarely. Uh, so, I mean, the concept of uh, where we are in terms of technology is, is quite interesting. I mean, so I think the big thing is going to be fabrication because fabrications will decide many things. Now, whether temperature changing fabrications are going to meet the standards of being sustainable, I'm not sure. I really am not sure about it. Uh, but I think this is a very interesting thing. But the next kind of thing we wanted to move on to discuss is um, what is the impact? So obviously globally many things are happening. We have a war that's raging and nobody kind of understood how, how material the impact this war was going to be in many things. One of the largest things is petroleum and oil uh, and how that impacted, how many kind of People didn't realize this exactly what a huge hub Ukraine was, for instance, is in, in clothing production, um, and how that impacted us. But also the volatility in terms of, you know, China having issues in terms of just being able to deliver things and being cut off by the rest of the world, people interrogating the sourcing, the where things are coming, fair trade and all of those things. What do you guys think will be the uh, biggest impact on the economy? and uh, of Africa, really, and how it would it impact us in fashion. I think for me, the most important thing is, number one, unpacking what Ago is all about. And, uh, and that's another master class for five hours. For me, it is about unpacking those rules and seeing what damage do we do to Africa as, as a continent. Because we have just been signing our lives away without actually understanding, and China has literally a China mall in every suburb. And we're losing out on that. So those are the type of things, again, going back to education, how the Department of Trade and Industry does not educate the creatives about those fundamental things that are being signed off without actually filtering down to, 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 to the creatives and eventually to the consumer. So AGOA only has five more years. We and still we have, have it, but yeah. then it, the, but the, the whole of South Africa will be Chinatown. No, no, literally, and yeah. not being on any, because in every, every suburb, it's got some kind of China mall. So we'll be taken over by then, and then we'll not be having, factories are closing down, yes, creators are not being employed because of what Agoa has done to the, to, to the continent. I mean, I, I tend to agree with you in terms of maybe the impact that China has on the world, but, uh, on, on South Africa, but it's not, the whole world hasn't been immune to China. The whole garment industry in America closed down because of China. And the reason is that we don't have a government or we don't have a department who actually could have contemplated to this and, and, to, and, and to monitor and all developed that. a kind of strategy to manage it. So, you know, if you look at throughout Africa, and I was having this very interesting conversation last night where I went around to see a new shop that is opening in Santon called Asante. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Beautiful, amazing, Rwandan based. And I was like, wow, this production is done in Rwanda? Yes, run by Chinese. You know, I saw amazing um, shoes out of Ethiopia who's manufactured Chinese. Chinese. So, uh, yeah, the impact is huge, and that inroad into economies is huge, but it's a political trade off as well. They don't just, nobody just arrives in a country, yeah. governments allow this to happen, you know. In, in Cameroon, have you seen any impact in terms of the uh, entry of like kind of very cheap fast fashion via Chinese or Chinese manufacturing? Yeah. Uh, oui, effectivement, au Cameroon, on a, euh, on a ce problème d'importation de, de vêtements euh, qui viennent de Chine. Oui, on a vraiment ce problème-là. Mais encore une fois, la mode n'est pas très la mode euh, euh, de qualité, en, la mode en termes d'économie, de, 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 de vecteur d'économie, ce n'est pas vraiment développé au Cameroun. Donc, euh, on peut dire que l'impact négatif n'est pas vraiment ressenti. Moi, j'ai plus envie de dire que euh, le problème au Cameroun, et peut-être dans cette sous-région d'Afrique centrale, c'est que le, la mode n'est pas un secteur qui est soutenu par le gouvernement. Donc, c'est ça notre vrai problème. Et bon, je vous entends un peu dire que vous avez à peu près ces problèmes-là en Afrique du Sud, mais chez nous, c'est encore pire. Donc, euh, il va vraiment, vraiment falloir que l'État s'y mette parce qu'on est vraiment, vraiment, vraiment très loin. Comme je dis encore, c'est des concepts. 
dont on ne parle pas au Cameroun en fait. Ça n'existe pas. Um, so, um There are some uh, Chinese manufacturers and vendors in Cameroon, definitely, but they are more focused on like the fast fashion and like uh, cheap garments. So in terms of local designer, it doesn't really impact because they are actually uh, filling a space uh, that is not concerned by people who sell fashion and all. And the main issue is that actually in Central Africa, most of the customers are not really um, keen on buying local designers and buying like I would say medium or luxurious item made locally. So the main concern for us is not really China, but more like uh, the government who should invest and also educate the population to start buying quality goods made in Africa. And all the concerns that have been raised up here about like the, the, the investment, the ba bank not backing up people and all, are so far away for us from uh, Central and West Africa, because for us it's like really we are still in the fashion industry at the like really the, the basics that are not fulfilled in terms of support, in terms of um, production, in terms of also, how do you say, uh, shipping. So all those things, we don't even have another alternative than China. Like no matter what, we, we are just at the bottom. So the evolution for us is even like uh, far from you. I should have did this earlier, but please can I sit down here? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, please do. Um, that, I mean, that's very interesting. And then going back to Philippe in terms of like, um, Philippe, what do you think should be measures to prohibit or to kind of mitigate this kind of invasion of not just China, because there are a few other kind of countries also coming in with uh, very cheap and fast fashion? I think for me it goes back to, to governance and, and to policing. Uh, I'm going to make one example of, of Matrosa, for instance. Uh, when you walk down uh, Johannesburg CBD, there is literally every shop that is selling a fake Matrosa. For me, at this point in time, the government should have stood up because not only is it, are they killing a factory that employs over 100 people, number two, it is our cultural identity. So between two departments, they have done nothing about it within the last five mm. months. So it means there's no proper policing, there's no proper governance. So for me, we have to start there. And who's going to champion that? Uh, for, 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 me, for me, when it started happening a couple of years ago, with the South African music industry, with all the fake CDs, all the musicians came together and they do it, do it, and the government listened. Mm. So for me, it's also about the designers themselves putting their heads together and helping each other curb all that. But don't you think it's because we have such a fragmented industry? Nobody uh, is interested in... So, I mean, this big thing is that we have this network. The network doesn't access each other, but surely we need to move past the network and have a community. Uh, because communities of practice raise one another. There's, uh, you know, as much as you say those kind of things, you need to have people who stand together. So people won't stand together just for one single person if everybody's not a cohesive voice. Yeah, but then again, it goes back to technology. Let's use technology positively where we can put those, our, our, our data into putting mm -hmm. organizations together and putting movements together to protect each other. But why has that not worked in Johannesburg and in South Africa? You guys had a very, very active or a very well-formed council, and that's gone bankrupt. The South African National Fashion Council has gone up, yeah. belly up. And that's because I think we need to learn something out of Google, is that nothing is going to work. So this idea of rapid prototyping or finding solutions means if you don't have the right individuals there, they don't have the requisite skill, skills and they don't really understand the context of the problem, you're never going to solve anything. So younger voices for me are more important because older voices tend to get caught up in the, the whole politics and very emotional, and emotional. And drama of everything. Um, so you are right, and I'm hoping that younger people drive this. And also, it's also about creating, for, for me, using your data and your technology and Instagram positively, then we have more of this type of, of sit downs and talking. Yeah. Then people can gather and, 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 and write down things that they can, that, that can hand, hand over to the government. So for me, it is a lot of things that we are overlooking 
that are actually killing us. And don't you think that there's a whole um, culture in our country specifically, I'm not sure if this happens in your country, Anna, but we tend to find there's these flavors of the, flavors of the month that come along. And the big, con but the big conversation happening globally amongst communities of color is something called decoloniality. So have you ever thought why in the entire America we hardly have any black designers showing at fashion. In fact, I can't think. There's one, Tracy Reese, that shows yeah. in America, right? Uh, but there are no black fashion designers. So you go anywhere around the world, and you, we're trying very hard to find people of color on the catwalks. You go around the world, and you don't find Indian designers either, right? And it's this context of decoloniality. So I get slated when I say, prints necessary that we think are African are not African. They were introduced, yeah, introduced to. to us. But we celebrate these prints. We think these things define us. And white Western kind of bodies people look at it and think, wow, that's such fun. When will we rise about? So as long as you keep us there, that's fine. The minute you start doing something different, it, ups it, it kind of, oh, well, we you know, how could a, a, a designer out of Africa do these kind of things, right? And the other thing is, in this industry, we love tokenism. So the minute a good person of color comes up, you'll definitely see some other kind of entity, magazine, whatever, design house, grasp them and think, that's the only person. So again, you're so right. We need this organization. We need these platforms to say, stop this. This is not right. There are other people beyond this. Because the minute they go belly up and they don't, they're hustling for money and rent money and whatever. It's, 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 there are a lot of things that we have to sort out. For me, it, I was absolutely flabbergasted when immediately we still amidst COVID and there were South African Fashion Awards. What we, and it was sponsored by the Department of, of, of Arts and Culture. With that kind of money, during the two years, a lot of designers did not work. They could have given 100 designers 10,000 rents each to pay for their rents. To, to find some kind of material to make even masks. So there's a lot of things that within government levels that are just being brown enveloped. I can't agree with you more because I've been having this discussion. I mean, and I've aged with this discussion with government since this last year. And it's, 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 it's absolutely mired in red tape. And, and it's not and it's only been, lack it, of understanding of the industry. And, and it's not even about even only the fashion awards. For me, let's stop having all these overseas uh, exhibitions of spending millions of taking designers all over yeah. the world while they don't even have proper infrastructures, while they only, they only have one sewing machine in their studios. But we're spending money flying them all over the world, giving them false hope. Yeah. So there's a lot of... Uh, in discrepancies that we have to sort out within that system. Absolutely. I believe transparency is key. I mean, yeah, people completely. giving money to buy buildings, uh, start businesses, and I don't know where that money is going. But is this the culture we're going to endorse or foster? It's really beyond me. I think a designer, at some point, if they don't really have a business after five or six years, then, you know, unless it's a massive expansion, there's an issue around this. But... You, you're right. I mean, we could sit here for another five hours, and I think that actually it's an important thing that maybe Hannah Lees and Roshni take up, and maybe we should look at it. Um, I think I want to come back to, I mean, there's a question in terms of guiding things. What are African trends coming forward? And I'm like, no, I don't think we should play into this thing again of coloniality, of thinking just as Africans. I think, how do we play globally in a global space? You know, what are the trends impacting the rest of the world? That's where we need to be. That's the most interesting thing. And I think um, I, think I really want to ask uh, Anna and uh, Philippe as well, because they interact on a daily basis with younger designers, other people in the design industry, of what they firstly think is, Philippe, what is the actual biggest concern thinking of the future because there's this big fear of the future of the unknown and what do they what is it that they would want uh, looking at what's happening globally in terms of a context of Africa 
but not really a trend of what's happening in Africa because I don't believe that in that. I think uh, I think, uh, for me, I think Africa has always been a trend. So for me, anything that's ancient is, can completely be modern the following day in terms of African context. So for me, it is people need to, designers need to stop tapping into their own creative psychosis. People, designers need to stop reading Vogue. Designers should stop uh, walking into shopping malls and buying h and I'm not saying literally, but for me, inspiration is always around your corner. It is with your neighbor, it is at your art gallery, it is all over the place that where actual designers don't tap into. So for me, it is about revisiting oneself. And I thought during the two, two years of COVID that these designers would come back into themselves and find out who they are. But then again, immediately COVID sort of like subsided, designers were the mainstream. I'm making another example. If you go to Senton City, Gucci, there's always a queue outside Gucci and Louis Vuitton. Africa Rise, there's, there's hardly anyone there, which is stalking 16 African designers. Who, and most of the people that buy Gucci and Louis Vuitton are the black people. So that, that's that revisiting all that methodology and creating a circular economy that can sustain us and that can transport us into a new notion. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I went to Africa Rise yesterday. Tula had a sip and shop event, and it was amazing to see it. It's a store that I really think we must support. And I mean, I know Africa uh, Fashion International is opening another store also with representation. And this is very, very important. I couldn't be bothered what Marco, uh, I mean, Bikari at Gucci is doing in terms of sustainability. It's all a big marketing campaign. Uh, you know, you just have to look at the plastic they use in the shoes and tell you lots. Uh, but I do want to see more interesting things coming out of here. But I think, Philippe, you need to have another masterclass just on your own yeah. in terms yes. of uh, in terms of making it very South African and very and contextualizing it with local kind of examples. And I think another important thing, I think also with designers, what for me should be an everlasting trend is not using a print and thinking that's design because a lot of designers become lazy because they just go and they buy a printed fabric and they make an a landscape. I've designed something that's not designed. So I think for me, if designers could completely come in a house, start designing their own prints, start using a lot of, of, of African memes and African artifacts in, 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 in transporting the world into understanding our sensibility. But do you think you have to be geographically confined because you're just on the African continent? I think, I think for me, it's, it's, it's not even about that. For me, if you don't love your roots and you don't love where you come from, as a creative, you, you can't go anywhere. But then how's that in terms of the rest of the world where well, well, that's you what get French designers? I mean, there's Dior, the season being inspired by something. I mean, I don't want to be confined. I love my... No, no, it's, 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 it's not confinement per se. We're still like a third world fashion country. So be, beyond understanding our roots first. That's what decoloniality is saying yeah. to you. It's saying to you that as long as white people in the Western world say to you, only find your inspiration on the African continent, you will only be here. But that's where collaborations happen. That's when you... you but you're, you're, give me an example of where it's worked. Uh, it hasn't worked necessarily, but I can make other examples where, for instance, I'll say with Mansu working with H&M, she used the iconography in terms of that, in interpreting a story. For me, it's about reversing the use of these big uh, again, uh, uh, stores. Look at collaboration and look at it. Was it an authentic or credible collaboration? Was it a global collaboration? It, it was global in the sense that it's sold into, I think, 60 countries, but it's not enough. All I'm saying is that that is beginning stages of you know, trying to understand I ourselves. Know, I know a retailer that I work with, and they did these collaboration with designers, and they made out like, I mean, they spent more money on the marketing campaign, right? But you know the total number of units produced for the designers' collaboration was less than 300 units. Yeah, because now, also how is that an authentic thing? You wouldn't do that if you were doing it with Versace or Karl Lagerfeld. But because also, it's also a shift of consumer behavior, on the other hand, because we are always told anything that we buy that is South African or local African is only for weddings. That's why it says on an invitation, uh, traditional wear. Yeah. 
So for me, it's about the shift of, of consumer behavior and understanding that you can wear an African designer or, or a South African designer every day of your life. I agree with you, but I think one of the biggest things we made as a mistake is that we just, we're still a fledgling democracy. So I think people forget that. And part of that is being celebratory, wearing traditional costume, attire, all of these things is important. It's really important in terms of creating, fostering a sense of community, a sense of identity with communities. But let's be honest, you know, I was having a discussion with the Indian Fashion Council and they were saying, a sari might be fashionable, but it's not fashion. Very interesting. And it's a thing that's kept India in that yeah. colonized state. They produced the best fabrics. The British took all those fabrics, used them, and still use them but they're never actually given the platform unless it's like intricate embroidery or traditional cultural threads. And I'm thinking, when are we moving past that? But maybe Anna wants to have a comment in terms of Cameroon and how that plays out. I have a bit of Philippe, in fact. That is to say that we can also try to change the things to make the pour profiter de, de plateformes comme ici ou alors avoir euh, des Africains ou des gens qui soutiennent euh, la mode euh, en Afrique, parce que ce n'est pas la mode africaine, mais c'est la mode en Afrique. Donc euh, des gens euh, qui soutiennent cette mode-là pour euh, créer nos propres codes aussi, euh, évidemment en restant dans les concepts généraux importants comme la durabilité, etc. Mais en, en s'imposant un peu plus, parce que comme il disait, qu'on arrête de lire Vogue, qu'on voilà, qu qu fasse nos propres choses avec la richesse qu'on a en Afrique. Parce que l'Afrique est très riche. So she totally agrees with Philippe uh, in the terms that we, are, we have to like, really take root in our culture and all the bases and redefining uh, all those concepts by taking them and appropriating them, uh, them to us, rethinking our codes, our culture, we will also create new, how to say, new staples. So indeed, definitely, we have to stop uh, checking Vogue and all and really recenter on ourselves and redefining our own code because uh, it's not African fashion, but fashion in Africa. Yeah. That's great. I wanted to, before we actually close off for questions, like ask for some final kind of thoughts, and I'm sure, Philippe, you have quite a few, but in terms of just the South African context and moving forward <clears throat> other than just, I mean, we know we touched about the need for education and then the need for a strong kind of council and a cohesive voice in the industry. But what are the other things that really, when you sit up at night and think, hell, I could do that? Uh, I think the most important thing I would challenge everyone is before you walk out of your house, look in the mirror, what are you wearing? Where does it come from? For, for me, I've made a conscious effort that at least 95% of what I wear daily is made in Africa or made in South Africa. So for me, that's the most important thing. When you step out of your house, check what you're wearing. C'était quoi la question encore que j'ai oublié That's fine. So, what are your comments? Maybe you can make your comments more specific to the continent and or Cameroon, but what are the other things that you think that are really key and important that you'd like to kind of touch upon for African designers moving forward? Okay, moi j'ai envie de, de, de mettre l'accent sur le rôle des gouvernements parce que définitivement, euh, du côté de l'Afrique centrale, franchement, il n'y a rien. Il n'y a rien euh, qui est fait par euh, l'État. Et donc, euh, voilà, on a besoin de l'État pour la formation. Euh, pour, euh, on a parlé de tout ce qui était euh, production, euh, des taxes, euh, importation, export, euh, les échanges entre pays. Euh, on n'a pas, euh, pas cette, ces opportunités-là dont on en a vraiment besoin. Donc, euh, je ne sais pas si on aura une conclusion après parce que je vais ajouter une conclusion. So for her, really, uh, she wants to emphasize on the role of the government because nothing can happen if the states, if the government and our leaders can't get involved 
in uh, our industry because it's the, the, the first window of the culture and of a country. So definitely in Central Africa and the rest of West Africa, there is really an effort to be done to help the, and structure the, the, all the sector in terms of investment, in terms of education, in terms of school, in terms of taxes to help people. Yes, importation and exportation and protecting also the local market. So definitely, if they don't get involved, no matter the effort that designer will do, we, we will be restrained and stay in, in our own things and can't be able to go to the next stage. Yeah, that's exceptionally true. Um, I mean, I had, as this closing remarks, actually legislation. Yeah. So... Uh, I think we kind of all on the same uh, plan. Yeah, is, is that legislation is key. Championing legislation is key. Having this voice, as Philippe said, is very key. Standing up and saying, no, I don't think this one should be on the Fashion Council. They have nothing to contribute. It's just a figurehead is key. But these voices of having a voice also without a sense of Pride. fear. No, no, you, you have to be driven yeah. and, and fearless. I think if you're and passionate, fearless. then the courage comes. You know, you're going to be up for many, much criticism. I'm always up there. Uh, but that's also fine. And you need bodies who track the progress. Yeah. Because quite often all these empty promises are made, but nobody's tracking the progress or what's actually happening. I, I mean, I'm very hopeful that the, that... I'm actually very hopeful that from hearing voices here and hearing people you know, chatting while I've been here. I haven't done Joe Book for a long time, uh, as in, I'm not worried really about the show, but just interacting with people. And it's always amazing meeting young people. I met amazing people yesterday to chat to them, and so I'd rather be here than the Zeitz party in KT. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I think that was very interesting. I think we're going to open the floor for questions. And then you can address them to Philippe, myself, or Anna, and we'll take it from there. So there's a question here. So I don't know if it's a question um, or com comment. Um, firstly, thank you so much. This has been such an event. It's invigorated my thought process and my mind so much. Um, so I work in the area of partnerships, communications, and advocacy. And when I started Style Africa Fashion Network in 2014, it was literally to be a voice for South African fashion designers. But as a single person, you know, trying to invigorate uh, how people see Africa or how people see who we are as a culture, I thought that our fashion was a way of telling the world so much about who we are just by showing up and presenting our stunning and beautiful history, culture, and design. And I loved what you said in terms of, um, and, and I rephrased it in a different way. I said it's not just about celebrating South Africa in design, but also celebrating the designer being South African. And many a times I find when we send South African designers overseas, people love our designs. And the moment they hear South African, it's almost like they're shocked. It's like, how is that even possible? Like, you guys can make such amazing, beautiful clothes. Um, but just around policy, uh, so I also work for a company in my day job, <laughs> which focuses on three principles, which uh, speaks to what you were talking about, education. And it's around entrepreneurship, ecosystem enablement, um, and building high-impact entrepreneurs that really help the value chain all the way down. And the first pillar is about building a pipeline of talent. The second one is championing a culture of responsible entrepreneurs. And that goes, goes back to whatever you want to call sustainability, transformation. Um, yeah. And then the third one is support for entrepreneurs. And that is also finding ways that we can break those barriers. So yes, it's important to have government in the room, but I think it's impor more important to have the people who influence government in the room because government does not have all the answers. They don't know how. And many a times I sit in conversations with them and it's more about, so what do you have for us that's solution-driven? Because they don't have the solutions. 
And I think those people that you were talking about in terms of the partners and the stakeholders, it is definitely about stakeholder mapping. Who are the right people? Who are the people ca that can influence? And I'm fortunate enough to work for a corporate that, that has that kind of voice, that wants to push those, you know, grow uh, entrepreneurs. And we are looking at a technicolor, sector-driven, and I'm really trying to push in my company that the creative economy is one of those, because they have to pick three. And you know there's so many that we have to focus on. Agriculture, oceanography, there are just so many. Um, and because that's my personal passion, I'm like, but there's so much you can do here. Imagine if government just put money in manufacturing. Um, it could solve so much problems. So yeah, sorry. So that's just <laughs> my two cents. Um, yeah, but I support, and I would love to be on the, um, I don't know, this network or the advocacy stream, <laughs> whatever, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's a question here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Seneo Muji. I'm a fashion designer from Botswana. And uh, being from a, a country that has a small population, obviously we have fewer people to consume our fashion. My concern or my comment goes along with Philippe. I share the same sentiment with him. It goes back to us as Africans to realize that we are a part of gold. The West look up to us for inspiration. We look up to the West in terms of what they can do with technology and everything else. What, do we, what can we do as Africans to actually come together to make sure that what the West crave, crave for, from us or what they want to collect from us, how do we make sure that we keep it for us but export it to the West instead of the West importing it or getting it from us? I think also, again, the governments don't have any clue of what we are doing. Why can't we come up with an African fashion council where we come as countries to say we are here, we have the talent, we have the skills, we have the, the culture that you are so interested in. Why can't we keep it within Africa? I think for me the challenge right now, let's be, we should be speaking to Roshni and to Annelise. For me, it, this is a great platform to kickstart things. Uh, like they, 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 for me, if, it, if there were 10 people here, I would have cancelled everything just to be here to share and engage. So for me, this is a perfect platform to start that African Fashion International movement of understanding and engaging. So this is the perfect platform and this is the kickstart to a much more brighter future. But it has to be inclusive, diverse and representative. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not. I don't believe any Fashion Week actually at the moment is that. Uh, and I think this is a very important thing to address moving forward. I don't think that this is not a, a criticism just leveled at AFI. I think just generally um, you need to have greater representation and representation which instills confidence in consumers. So not one hit wonders that are one year showing next year you don't hear of them. There's, there has to be a level, and I know you try and do this, but there has to be a level of selection and this process has to be very considered. Otherwise, we just bring in bad designers, badly made clothes into the, into the sphere. Um, I, Philippe, I think you must drive this idea of a, of a industry movement and or kind of formation of a council as such. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to even wipe off my freckles for me to be, to be able to, to contribute to my continent in positively. Yeah. So for me, it is not about me, it is about the future. It is about what the creatives have been suffering over the years. So for me, that's why I'm throwing it back at Annalise and, and Roshni to say, this is the beginning of a, of a great movement that we can multi-layer yeah. uh, with, uh, with all the stakeholders from, mm. from throughout the continent. I think yes, and I mean, I want to make this comment publicly because you guys know that I'm, you know, you can't fool to me, really. Uh, but the issue around this is if you're talking about an African narrative, like I've walked around and I see the front hoarding on the new shop or where you are, then you must, you must own it. You must own it in a very authentic, credible way, 
and you must move away from being event organizers but stakeholders in this industry. That's the big, That's a big shift. shift. Any other questions? Um, There's a gentleman here. Um, I wanted to direct this question to Philippe because you're introduced as a mentor. So I want to hear what you think about um, the lack of fashion incubators for young designers in South Africa. And I'm speaking from the perspective of a designer who's just finished their degree. And when you look at, for example, in the UK, there's a, a fashion incubator called Fashion East, which for two decades now, they've been um, giving designers resources and the platform to um, build their brands and build their identities and to be able to be independent. For example, Kim Jones, creative director of Dior, or Maximilian, creative director of Ferragamo. But in South Africa, the, you, you kind of have to navigate your way by yourself, really. Like, My understanding of when they started having these, these boards from Cape Town Fashion Council to KZN Fashion Council and eventually the South African Fashion Council was to start with those hubs. And there were those hubs, which are going to be number one, mentoring uh, uh, creatives coming out of, out of, out, out of uh, uh, design schools. Number two, in helping them hone their skills. Because the most important thing, you might be creative, but if your quality control is not up to par, and you need to have those kind of systems that could help you from college to do your internship and to have a mentor to oversee your methodology and your, your, your craftsmanship. So for me, it goes back again to the fact that we need to start establishing those boards. And those boards would now have, would be multi-layered in having hubs, in having financial systems helping, in having the technology side of it, and eventually it will be an, uh, an amazing chain of, 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 of growth within the, within the creative industries. I want to just add something to that. So these councils, for me, have been the worst things possible. In fact, I probably was on one council for a month and I decided to resign. And again, it goes back to my thing that you can't put a bunch of people who don't understand what the problems are and don't have the skill to solve those problems. But they're there to entertain, do shows after show after show and squander and do stupid things. And then eventually government also says, well, what have you done? Where's your measurable outcomes? Where are these audited outcomes of what you're doing? And they don't do anything. I can definitely speak from Cape Town. I think hogwash, total I don't know what they're doing, really. I don't know who they've helped. But at the, eventually, you have to go out and do it on your own. So when I started this thing four years ago, Future Wear, it's about finding voices like yourself, taking them on board, and finding opportunities around the world. I mean, I sit on this advisory board for Harvard, but I'm like, I want to see more people from Africa here. And next year, I don't know if anybody knows, you celebrate 50 years of hip-hop. They have a hip-hop institute there, but it's the greatest repository repository of black culture from excellent yeah nike to music to art to, and and i think what we need now are thinking designers you know not like philippe who says oh you just went bought this fabric you created some you know create your own thing you know start with developing intellectual property the key thing about intellectual property is it's a benchmark of how successful or forward-thinking we are as an economy. Look at the FTSE 100, they're all, the, the biggest, biggest companies, they're all creative companies. They're all driven by creativity. So as long as we also stop being the, in, you know, we always call upon to do the entertainment for different things, do a show for this, do a show for that, do a show for everything, you know. But we've also got to stand up and say, no, you know, we can't do these things anymore. Any more questions? There's one right in the back. We're going to take two more questions and then we're going to have to wrap it up. And then I think you can have individual conversations, whoever you want to, over a cup of coffee or something. Hi, this is a question for the whole panel. I just wanted to ask, uh, you guys talked about sustainability and all this nice stuff. And you're talking about coming together as a fashion industry. So do you think perhaps it's not just a fashion problem, it's more a creative entrepreneur problem. That spans across the same problem a fashion designer has 
I'm sure a photographer has. And I'm sure a filmmaker has. And don't you think maybe because we have such a small country and such a small market for all these disciplines that they could just come together? Do you think it's possible that ecosystem can exist where it's paths between fashion, film, art, and music? Uh, hence, I kept on using the word the creative industry is more than fashion design because within that, within that uh, as a fashion designer, you might have an idea of a print, but you're going to need a graphic designer. So everything works, it's, it, it, it's linked together. So I kept on using the word the creative industry is more than just fashion design because we all need each other within that chelly vein. Thank you. A question right at the back there. Hi, I'm Kukule Etu from Oak Ave magazine. Um, for me, it's about going back to the basics, right? What makes us African? And um, hearing blockchain technology, block te blockchain technology is for the industrial revolution, and it's about um, collaborative. As Africans, we've been doing that, right? It pushes us to say that Ubuntu, working in community, you were talking about circulating the economy among ourselves, right? That is blockchain technology, collaborative and circulating the economy among ourselves. As um, South African, we always have fashion weeks in Santon, in Rosebanks. Why don't we go back to Esowe, to Ekasi? That's where education comes in, right? We're talking about not reading um, Vogue anymore. Why don't we go to online and go and like Oak Ave magazine? So for me, it's just going back to those basics. User experience. User experience in fashion. Go to where your clients are. Your clients are not in New York. Your clients are not in London. Your clients I in in so way to Ekasi if you're going to put the education aspect of it. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to tap on that. Um, for me, again, it goes back to consumer consumer relations and consumer awareness. Um, I'm going to make another example. Ma Maponyo Mall, most of the shops closed down in Maponyo Mall purely for one reason. Most of them would not buy their, their cavella at Spies in Maponyo Mall, but they'd rather go to Rosebank because mine is from Rosebank. So w for me, it's about shifting shifting their, 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 their consumer behavior and the way they think, how we start uh, growing their, 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 their township economy back again. I think that's a very important uh, thing in terms of also looking at demographics and what cultural kind of notions we have within fashion. But I mean, it's very interesting you say that, but you know, we have queues outside Louis Vuitton and Gucci, so yeah. clearly not in Soweto yet. Yeah. But that will just tell you the... I don't like to use this word mentality, but the state of where we are in terms of consumerism in the country. We just, I just find that it's not only South Africans, I just find as Africans, we've just consistently been consuming and consuming and not questioning. And I think it's about time that we start questioning where our money goes, and I think we should start really building on a secular economy for all of us to survive in the future to, to look brighter. Yeah, and I think that's what COVID was possibly meant to do, is that yeah. we stopped and interrogated brands. I mean, many people, if you saw Stella McCartney, who is quite a vegan brand, green brand, accepted government money, but was laying off her staff in very bad ways. And this was called into question. People questioned these things. So until we also have a voice where we question people and we hold people accountable and responsible we allow these things to continue, you know. Thank you. It's been a very, very informative session. I think you must. I would like, uh, before we close up, Anna would like to say something. Um, okay. Uh, C'était très important pour moi d'ajouter ce mot. Uh, je vois que ça fait 15 ans que uh, Africa Fashion International uh, existe. Uh, je suis je pourrais dire un pur produit de cet événement-là, parce que je suis une des rares designers de l'étranger qui a eu la chance de revenir tout le temps. 
Et vraiment, euh, ce que Créan est devenu aujourd'hui en Afrique, au Cameroun, c'est beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup euh, grâce à Africa Fashion International. Et vraiment, je voudrais euh, faire un grand témoignage euh, de remerciement euh, pour euh, le docteur euh, Precious Motchepe, que je ne connais pas personnellement, mais qui m'a donné cette chance en tant que designer africaine. Et je dis vraiment, vraiment, c'est une euh, grâce pour vous, Sud-Africains, d'avoir euh, cette plateforme-là. Vous ne savez pas à quel point. Euh, et puis, suite à cette chance-là, moi, j'ai... Ça m'a galvanisé en tant que designer, mais aussi j'ai organisé des événements mmh. au Cameroun où j'ai invité des designers sud-africains. Pas encore. Ça va venir. Donc, il y avait euh, Max Sosa, il y avait Nekid Happy, il y avait David Lallé. Et d'ailleurs, l'équipe de production, c'est une équipe euh, sud-africaine, Yann Malan. Donc, pour dire que ce genre de plateforme est très, très, très importante. Merci beaucoup. So... So it was very important for her to, like, uh, to highlight that is the 15 years of AFI. And for her, it's really a big pleasure and a big proud to, to know that she has been here every year to represent her country. And she wouldn't be here, like standing here, and the success that she has in her country without this event who gave her like, the confidence, the exposure. So if you don't realize how important it is Uh, like the chance that you have to have this organization and especially with the, the implication of Dr. Precious Motsepe who has really supported her, even not knowing her personally, but supporting her year after year and inspiring her so that after that, knowing everything that has been here and like uh, creating bondings with South African designers and other, she went back in Cameroon and created events where she invited also South African designer like David Lale, Max Rosa, to come and showcase even with production team. So uh, it's very important. It's creating, um, what do you say, bridges in African country, with African culture between all different uh, people. And even myself personally can say that because we come from Senegal. So definitely, uh, it's, uh, like, it's a big shout out to Afi. Definitely. So she really wanted to, to highlight this aspect. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You, we, we will be around so you can ask questions one-on-one. And thank you.